osteoporotic vertebral fractures is a highly debated topic in literature. When is surgery required? What is the best surgical approach? And how should we go about performing the surgery? Are all burning questions that have yet to get good answers. Over the next few minutes, I, Dr. Gautam Zaveri from the Jaslo Hospital Research Center in Bombay, I'm going to share my experiences and my approach to dealing with surgery in osteoporotic vertebral fractures. The first question is when should you operate? And here I'd like to emphasize that more than 80% of patients with osteoporotic vertebral fractures will obtain significant pain relief within the first four to six weeks after injury. And hence surgery is generally not required for patients with osteoporotic vertebral fractures. In that case, when is it required? It is required in an acute situation when there are fracture is an unstable fracture, if there is an accompanying neurologic deficit, and later when there is a persistently painful osteoporotic fracture or painful vertebral pseudoarthrosis. The German Trauma Society has given us a definition a classification in order to determine which fractures are unstable, unlikely to do well with non-operative treatment and therefore require surgery. According to this classification, OF1 is a injury with bone marrow edema where the X-rays and CT scans do not see any deformation of the vertebra. These are stable injuries can be treated non-operatively. Similarly, OF2 can also be treated non-operatively because there is very little deformation of a single end plate and little involvement of the posterior vertebral wall. OF3, on the other hand, involves a more significant end plate fracture, a more significant involvement of the vertebral wall. And the danger here is that this fracture may collapse over time, resulting not only in pain and deformity, but a delayed neurologic deficit. It is, there is still controversial whether this fracture should be treated non-operatively or surgically. On the other hand, OF4, where there is a significant failure of the vertebral frame, there is a complete burst fracture, a word significant vertebral collapse, or a split cleavage type of fracture, these are unstable and require surgical stabilization. The final OF5, is a vertebral fracture with accompanying posterior ligamentous injury. And this is unstable, requiring surgical stabilization. Surgery in these elderly, frail, and patients with multiple comorbidities may often be fraught with complications, either intraoperatively or postoperatively. The surgical challenges themselves include a challenge in obtaining good implant purchase in the osteoporotic bone, a challenge in obtaining adequate reconstruction of the anterior column so that load bearing may be adequately permitted. And in the long term, preventing junctional fractures and failures and achieving a solid fusion. The first challenge is an obtaining adequate implant purchase. In recent times, cement augmented pedicle screws and expandable tipped pedicle screws have become popular in obtaining good hold in osteoporotic bone. However, in my practice, I have found little use for cement augmented pedicle screws. And in the majority of the patients, I am able to get away using other tr tricks in, to obtain good implant purchase. These include either under tapping or avoiding tapping of the screw, using longer screws with bicortical purchase or screws with a larger diameter, we often use screws with dual threads, a cortical thread in the pedicle and a cancellous thread within the vertebral body to get better purchase. Instead of using a typical pedicle screw trajectory, which is medially oriented, we sometimes use a cortical screw trajectory, which is outwards and upwards, getting purchase within the pedicle and the end plate and therefore having a better hold. In some cases where the pedicle screw does not seem to have adequate purchase, I try tend to supplement it with sublaminar wires. And as a rule in osteoporotic bone, I use longer implant constructs, typically three above and three below the fracture site. 
one of the biggest challenges in the osteoporotic bone is adequate anterior column reconstruction if your adequate if your anterior column is not reconstructed it cannot transmit loads adequately and therefore there is a flexion loading or a kyphotic uh, bending force which is applied on the posterior implant this results in pull out of the implant or failure at the junction and how does one reconstruct the anterior column if the patient's primary problem is instability and neurologic deficit and there is very little deformity in spite of the vertebral collapse i tend to do an in situ stabilization with decompression of this uh, of the neural elements if the preoperative x rays supine and standing film show a sig significant difference in vertebral height these patients are treated with cement augmentation of the fractured vertebra along with posterior stabilization however if the vertebra is completely collapsed and there is or there is a split cleavage fracture i tend to do a vertebrectomy and reconstruct with cage as long as the bone is of a relatively decent quality if the bone is extremely weak then i tend to do a vertebral shortening where i shorten the posterior vertebral column so that the end plates come closer to each other and the amount of flexion load the loads on the posterior implant are reduced in the long term the problem is with junctional fractures and failures and the best way to avoid junctional fractures and failures is to avoid ending your fixation at a previously fractured level or at junctional levels periparatide is the single most important thing that has been shown to reduce the risk of junctional fractures and failure other tips and tricks include cement augmentation of the junctional vertebrae use of marceline tapes through the interspinous uh, through the spinous process in order to prevent junctional failure and use of transverse process hooks the final challenge is to achieve a good spinal fusion in all patients where i am doing a posterior or posterolateral fusion in osteoporotic bone i tend to supplement my autograft with an equal amount of allograft so that i got a good scaffold in order to promote the fusion i have rarely found the need for using bone morphogenic protein however i routinely use periparatide in the perioperative and postoperative period in order to reduce in promote the spinal fusion of this bone to conclude surgery although rarely required in osteoporotic vertebral fractures is indicated for patients with neurologic deficit ligament instability or in patients where cement augmentation is contrite is indicated you must remember that anterior surgery alone is doomed to failure in the osteoporotic bone and therefore majority of the times the surgery involves a posterior stabilization decompression if necessary and anterior column re reconstruction if necessary posterior surgery in osteoporotic bone can be challenging because of the challenges of implant purchase challenge of anterior column reconstruction prevent in the long term preventing junctional failure and pseudoarthrosis thank you mm -hmm.